because that way you'd probably be more free, free associate what God's given you in the moment. But the outlines are fun. You know, I, I like the outlines too. Um, but let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we bow our heads. We just want to give you thanks for this beautiful morning. We pray keep Dave, Amber, and the boys safe, and Paula, and the whole fam. And we pray, Lord, thank you for being with all of us, bringing us here safely today. We pray guide us in fellowship by your spirit and open our hearts to what you have for us today and each moment. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Travis and the gang are going to come on up and give us some beautiful music. Good morning, Lucy. Okay. I'm good. You're good? Mark, testing, Mark. One, two. Check one. Can you hear me now? How about now? We'll morning, keep everybody. It up. You'll hear it in a minute. All right, so we don't have the, uh, there's only one song, I think, that's in the book this morning. That'll be at the end of service. It'll be the last song. This one is uh, Jesus Paid It All. It's an old hymn, if you guys know it. So. Sing along if you know it. I hear. Savior say, thy strength indeed is strong, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thy all in Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, See, 
It is windy up here, and I'm not talking about Bob's wife, man. <laughs> Something else. <laughs> that song's called In Christ Alone. I like it. it it's, a, it's a beautiful song. If you listen to the words, it just it says it all. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength. My soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God.
Thank you, thank you. Weren't they awesome? Wow. Thank you, guys. Travis, Lucy, Victoria, and Wes. That was really good. Really good. Can't wait to hear some more. It is breezy up here. Not complaining. I really, it feels great. I don't know how it's going to do with my pages. So hopefully I'll remember some of this stuff. <laughs> but, uh... It's really uh, interesting getting back into the study uh, on Exodus, and we are in Exodus chapters 3 and 4, and I'm telling you, when you think you know these Bible stories from when you were a kid, and you go back and look at them, it's like, yeah, you remember some of it, but there is so much more. There is so much happening. Um, did you ever feel, this is a rhetorical question, did you ever feel that you just weren't adequate for whatever you felt like you were called to do? Do you ever feel like you wish you could speak like somebody else or sing like somebody or have leadership skills or just didn't have any fear or anxiety? Or have you always felt supremely confident? Who's always felt supremely confident? You can go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Even the person that comes across as most confident, you'll be surprised. Uh, you'll be surprised. And when we look at these biblical figures and we think of the things that they did, well, oh, well, they were biblical figures, right? They were the patriarchs or, you know, they were super blessed men or women. Um, they had special powers. Well, where did those powers come from? They were going to look and see just how fear-ridden some of the leaders in the Bible were at various times in their life. I mean, just read Psalms if you want to hear somebody pour out their fears and then see those fears take a different form and a different shape. But we left off with Moses had fled in fear. He had been a powerful member adopted into the royal family of Egypt and then seeing his Hebrew brothers in turmoil and seeing how they were treated, um, he ended up losing his temper and killing with his bare hands an Egyptian. And then one of the Hebrews called him on it a, a day or two later. And he's like, oh, whatever word you want to use, oh, something. Now they know. The word must be out. And before the Pharaoh could get to him and have him executed, he had beelined out into the wilderness, out into the desert, where he was to spend the next 40 years of his life. So Moses, he ended up getting married. He had a couple of sons. And we pick up now in Exodus 3, 40 years later, approximately, and let's see what he's doing. Now, Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. That gives us a little indication of what Moses was doing. He was working for his father-in-law, who was apparently a pagan priest. He was working for his father-in-law. He was shepherding it was a regular, everyday, blue-collar, hard-working, agricultural, if you would, job out in the middle of nowhere where he probably spent a lot of time alone and had to reflect on his memories when he had a lot of money and a lot of power and lived in a much higher standard of living as far as the world would look at it. So he's out there one day doing what shepherds do, and taking care of business, 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it didn't burn up. Now that's, that's a strange sight. Any of you that are into the outdoors, hiking, camping, hunting, even fishing out on the water, you know that you'll see things that you just wouldn't see if you didn't spend a lot of time in the outdoors. But a burning bush, a bush by itself out in the middle of nowhere, and it's on fire. And an angel of the Lord, and we're going to come to see that God's voice speaks to Moses out of this flame, out of this flaming bush. And Moses apparently is drawn near, as anybody would, to see what the heck this is all about. And God tells Moses to take off his sandals. He says, you are standing on holy ground. What an experience. What a spiritual, what a phenomenal experience. Uh, Rob Bell, in one of his wonderful NUMA videos, poses the question, do we pass burning bushes every day? Are they to our left and to our right as we go through our day, as we go through our life, and we're just so unaware, we're just so spiritually blind that we don't see them, that we don't hear God's voice, that we don't see God moving in the world, that we don't see God in nature, that we don't see God in other people, that we don't see God in our circumstances? Most people would ask, many would, where, where is God? And have some vague, perhaps, perception of a God somewhere, way out there in the wild blue yonder, I guess, out there in heaven, wherever heaven is. My first conception of God, honestly, was kind of like the Statue of Liberty, it's like, you know, my first impression of God at maybe three years of age. It was just kind of how I pictured God. Not exactly like the Statue of Liberty, but some authoritarian kind of powerful figure somewhere. But Moses is about to have quite an extended experience here. God also said... I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Can you imagine from just kind of mindlessly going through your work out there in the middle of nowhere, moving the sheep closer to the mountain, out there on the edge of the wilderness, nobody around, probably been out there for days and days, haven't spoken to anyone, and all of a sudden God is talking to you? The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spiritual spacious land to a land flowing with milk and honey. A land flowing with milk and honey. The promised land. Now, if your people are enslaved, or if you're, you are part of the people that are enslaved, and you have these brutal foreign taskmasters just, you know, shoving more work at you every day, arduous work, hard work, physical labor, and beating you with a whip should you falter or slow down or give in to exhaustion, the thought of the promised land, a land somewhere where there's plenty of food, plenty of drink, lush fields, fat cows, everything that you need, that would seem like just a dream. But here God has issued his promise. It's a continuation of or an unfolding of the promise that he gave Abraham and Isaac and Jacob 
And Joseph so believed God in his promise that Joseph said, when you leave this land, someday dig up my bones and take me with you. I want to be with my people. He knew that Egypt wasn't their home. You think that Moses is excited about this. I mean, you're like, God is talking to you, but wait, there's more. Therefore, God instructs him, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. How do you think Moses would respond to this? You think he would be excited? God is giving him, like, a purpose and a mission, and he is going to bring the people out of slavery, deliver them. But here's what Moses says to God. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? God says, certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you. That is, I who have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. You're going to bring him on the journey to this point, and all the people are going to worship me. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and they will say to me, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. What is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses is kind of backpedaling here. He's kind of dubious about all this. And God says, I am who I am. I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am sent me to you. God furthermore said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. has sent me to you, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. And we see it again and again in the Old Testament. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Do you hear the promise in that? God promised Abraham that he would have a son when it seemed impossible. God made promise to Isaac Jacob wrestled with the angel all night. And in the end, he gave in to God. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. He's saying, I want to send you into a land and you are going to inhabit that land and it's going to be your land and your children and your grandchildren, and it's going to be your land forever. God has a plan. He has unfolded a vision, and he's given this to an 80-year-old shepherd in the desert. And a shepherd is not even his flock. It's his father-in-law's. We get so caught up in not being good enough. We get so caught up in our own inadequacies, comparing ourselves to others, social standing, wealth, status, power, whatever it is, and then we think that we're less than. And I'm telling you, in the mental health field, there's a real problem with the 
middle school, high school, college age kids today because they're doing it like exponentially with social media. And there's these these illusions when we look at other people's profiles of what we think that their lives are all built up. And it's not the truth. That's the deception is that people are comparing themselves to a lie. A friend of mine put it this way, who has a lot of insight into addictions, having being a recovering opiate addict himself, and a counselor today, he said, somewhere you bought into a lie, and that lie told you that you aren't good enough. And you buy into it at a young age, most people. And it keeps us from stepping out of our comfort zone or our discomfort zone because we're afraid there'll be more. But do you know where the growth happens? Do you know where growth really happens? And this is true spiritually. On the growth edge. On the comfort growth edge. It's on the outside edge of your comfort zone. And Moses is about to be taken past his comfort zone. You're not hearing right now the Moses of the movie Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments with the power and the authority doing the mighty, wondrous things. No. You're hearing Moses as God came to him where he was at that point. And God tells him, he says, I know the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles which I shall do in the midst of it, and after that he will let you go. Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. He said, throw it on the ground. Moses took his staff and he threw it on the ground and it turned into a serpent. And God tells him to pick it up. So he picks it up by the tail and it becomes a staff. What a strange thing. Then God tells him to take his hand. Normal looking, probably weathered, leathery, hard working hand, the shepherd, and put it inside his cloak. And he tells him to remove it. And it's ghoulish, leprosy looking, a pale, grayish, white color. And he puts it back in his cloak, and he brings it out, and it's been restored. God is just giving him a demonstration of his power. Would you be convinced at this point? Moses wasn't. Nope, he's not. He's still not convinced. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord. Listen, he's pleading. Please, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither recently, nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. He's saying, I don't have good speaking skills. I'm not a good orator. I'm not a good communicator. I read years ago that some theologians believe that Moses had a speech impediment that in the Egyptian, for some reason, in the uh, house of Pharaoh, that they would take somebody that was being brought into the family, and they would take a coal, and they would burn the tongue of the small child. I, I don't know what that was about. I don't know if that was true. There was a lot of strange customs in Egypt, and in a lot of cultures of the day. There's strange, strange things out there in cultures today. So, for whatever reason... 
the Bible doesn't tell us, but from Scripture, all I'm hearing is, for whatever reason, is lack of confidence. Lack of confidence. He doesn't believe that he can do it. He doesn't believe. Maybe he has an anxiety disorder. Maybe he has some kind of developed some kind of social anxiety disorder where he's okay out there on his own in the wilderness with the sheep, but around a lot of people, I don't know. And maybe it's not that at all. Maybe any of us would be panic stricken at the thought of going into the Egyptian household to see Pharaoh himself and tell him that God said, all your slaves that are Hebrews, they're going with me. I mean, it's a good way to end up not alive. Not alive. You know, slavery back then, my goodness. Uh, somebody had mentioned to me a, a book, um, uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. And uh, the person that uh, mentioned it, he didn't suggest I read it, but he mentioned it in conversation a couple of different times. i got to check that book out. And it's interesting. It's interesting. But it, too, gives a picture of what slavery was like then and the links and efforts people would go to to avoid being pressed into slavery. And there were different levels of slavery, right? They had a whole code. If you were a slave to a decent master in Babylonia 5,000 years ago, you know, you could marry a non-slave and your children would not be slaves. Do you know that? And you might, if you do your work hard, where you get it done in time, you go out and start your own little business, you know, splitting, splitting profits with the master, of course, and eventually save up over the years enough to buy yourself out of slavery. The Hebrews didn't have that option. The Israelites were the lowest form of slavery under the Egyptians. They were brutalized, and now Moses is told by God to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So, what's going to happen? Most of you know, probably figured out, Moses is eventually going to get around to doing this, right? The Lord said to Moses, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then, go, and I, even I, will be with you. I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. God saying, Moses, I'm empowering you. I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to be your strength. But Moses replies, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. I think a lot of us are guilty of this. We want to see something done. But do we want to get involved? Somebody should take care of the homeless. Somebody should do something about Helping these kids with uh, broken families, with domestic abuse and all this stuff. Somebody should do something. Somebody. Who's somebody? The government. Well, you got a whole class of people think the government's the answer. And they don't want to give a penny out of their pocket. But they want the government to take care of it. They don't know where that money comes from, apparently. And then they, there's people, and the government does have its place. And then there's people who think their neighbors should do it. Or the church. I remember somebody at church. I'm not here now, so I'm not picking on anybody here. Came up to me before Sunday one time, years ago. And they thought that there needs to be a youth group special project, like a summer camp or something you know, to take kids out and do camping and sort of an outdoor sort of vacation Bible school. And I said, like, that summer, I'm like, 
I think that's an awesome idea. Who do you, who are you going to get involved to help you with this? I mean, I, it was astounding how much stuttering. And finally, it was he said, "You can't put that on me." Uh, oh. I feigned. I, I, I thought that this was your idea that you really wanted to kind of get this going. No, he wanted me to get it going. The question becomes, what is God telling you? Because I'll flip it over and say people will come to you, and people in churches will do it, pastors will do it, and they'll think you should do something. Be open-minded enough to listen, but listen more importantly to what God's telling you. What God's telling you. I remember the first time Dave said to me, are you ready to start ministering instead of being ministered to? And the immediate thought that went through my head was, Dave doesn't usually set, you, set people up with trick questions. So I bit, and I found myself over at Safe Harbor, volunteering. And it changed the whole direction of my life. So be willing to listen and be open to what God, the doors that he opens. But when the scary part came and they wanted me to start teaching, I had to go to God and totally depend on God for that. Totally had to depend on God for that because I knew I, was, I did not have the capability of doing that on my own. If God is leading you to do something, he will empower you to do it. Please send the message by whomever you will. Moses is basically saying, send somebody else, God. Pick somebody, whoever you want, as long as it's not me. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, is there, you hear God's getting frustrated here. Do we prescribe human emotions to God? I think God is way more real than we think. I think he's way beyond what we can comprehend, but he's revealed to us in Christ who he is, and Christ definitely got frustrated and even angry. And here it says his anger burned against Moses. God being mad doesn't mean that he's, like, hating, okay? God being mad doesn't mean that he's about to flick you off into the eternal abyss of the unquenching flame. That's not what God does. But he's angry. Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. How about that? God is angry, but he already knew how this was going to go because I don't think it was a coincidence that Aaron happened to be on the way out in the middle of nowhere to see Moses at that specific time, but here he comes. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I. You hear how I'm emphatic for the second time God is making this? I, even I. God is going to be with him. I will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. I had to underline that. If somebody said that, I... I, I almost sound blasphemous, but it can't be because God is saying that. He's saying that Moses will be as God to Aaron. That is the authority that God is giving to Moses, to be as God to Aaron. Can you imagine? Did God give up? Did God give up on Moses? Did he say, you know, you talk back a lot, and you argue with God, so forget it. The deal's off. I'm getting somebody else. No. He didn't. He said, your brother's on the way. He can go with you. 
He can help you. You're going to be his God to him. And he's going to say what I give him to say and what you give him to say. Because what Moses is going to give him to say is always going to be from God. You shall take in your hand the staff with which you shall perform the signs. You're going, Moses. You're going, and I'm going to be with you. And God gave him the support he need, that he needed. God will put the people in your life that you need. But it might not be the people you think it is. It may not be the people you're codependently attached to. It may be loosening up some relationships and some boundaries installed with people that are codependently attached to you. Because you can't be focused on God if you're listening to what everybody else is telling you. Now, we're not going to see Moses at this point argue with God anymore. He returned to his father-in-law. He got with Aaron. And the mission has begun. But God will put the people you need in at the time you need. And they may not look like the people you think you need. They may not be the people you would have picked. We don't see Moses going back and asking everybody, ah, I got this crazy idea, this wild thing happened. I want to tell you about it. And now let me give you a chance to talk me out of doing since I don't want to go anyway. But that's not how we say it. We just go around and listen to everybody else. Move to Tulsa, Oklahoma? Hmm. I don't think you should move there because I know so much and I'm a friend and you should listen to me instead of God. Do we really want to listen to people like that? Do we really want to listen to everybody else? I have found that God will give you confirmation when you're stepping out in faith. Our problem is we want to sit here, wait for the confirmation. We want to wait. We have this feeling. We have this something God's put on our heart. That's your ministry, by the way. John Glenn says, when something has been consistently on your heart, good chance that's your ministry. But we have to talk to God about it. We have to be willing to listen. Are we willing to get still? Are we willing to listen? And are we willing to... To do what God tells us. Are we willing to go with God? Because ultimately, that's what Moses is going to do. And it's not going to all be a wonderful, fantastic, comfortable, uh, pleasant journey. Because he's going to have to deal with Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is going to resist vehemently. And then there's going to be many trials we're going to see as we move forward. Many trials, wondrous things, but many trials and obstacles. There's going to be a, 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 a big sea that's in the way. There's going to be years and years in the wilderness, dry, treeless, rocky, hot, dusty wilderness. And then there's going to be a bunch of grumbling, complaining people that Moses is going to be dealing with. But God's will will be done. And we're going to see Moses in a very different light than we saw him now. But it is encouragement to know that God will take the least likely even somebody that is firmly convinced that they can't do it. And that's part of it, realizing that you can't do it. Because religious people get out and they're confident that they can do it in their own flesh. They don't see it that way. And they jump out and they want to do this and they want to do that. But too often the motivation is ego 
And the pastor used to ask all the time, how many people? How many people? How many people you got coming? How many people? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because I don't count. Is it about numbers? Are we about building something so people look at and say, oh, look how great they are? Or is it about totally yielding our life to God? I can tell you this, to the extent that we yield, it's amazing to see what God can do using the least likely amongst us. God doesn't look at it the way the world looks at it. God's operating in a completely whole different sphere, a completely different level. And when we yield to him, that's what we're tapping into. The supernatural power of God to be used by him as he sees fit. And that's what happened with these heroes of the Bible. Eventually, at some point, some sooner than others, they went from being doing their own thing to doing God's thing. Maybe being a religious zealot like Paul, hunting down Christians, hauling them off to prison, to being the author of half or more of the New Testament. See, it's not based on what we can do. It's based on what God can do. And there's nothing God can't do. So if uh, Travis and the gang want to come back up, All right. Check, check, check. Can we give it up for Bob? Every week he, he delivers. I love it. Yeah, Thank you, Bob. Good. Yep, that's it. Awesome. So uh, this next song is uh, right out of Scripture. I wish I could tell you where. I'm not a Bible scholar, but a lot of it is written on my heart, and I know that this one is, I believe it's right there in Psalms. So, um <laughs> which just means songs anyways. So we'll sing this, uh, sing this scripture for you. Lord bless you.
We got one more song for you. Wesley doesn't know that song at all. Thank you for singing along, I man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he still jumped in willing to help out, you know. We, we've practiced a few. So this one's a... Uh, this is a fun song to play. Can we, uh, can we, can we move that over here a little bit? Sure. sure. One earlier. So I got to share it. <laughs> I know the verse is just not in what order, so this will help us stay together here.
I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight, praise the Lord, I saw the light, oh I saw the light, I saw the light, no I just want to point out, all the people are still here. You guys, you guys notice that? Isn't that cool? Excellent. 